out of your hats, boy. It's a big day in Yellowknife. The annual closing of the Mackenzie River Ice Road, the link to the south. The first sign that a spring thaw is around the corner. Over the next month, the ice and snow will all disappear. And at the Buffalo Airways hangar, the spring thaw is forcing a rush on the maintenance of one of the company's two C-46 aircraft. We're gonna change ice shields over, and basically it's a strip of skin in the prop area that the ice flings off and dents it. Engineer Adam Smith is handling the overhaul. This damage is uh, pretty serious with the ice shield here. The ice shield protects the fuselage from ice flying off the propellers. This C-46's ice shield hasn't been replaced in nearly 50 years. I would say it's about time to change it. Adam and his crew have to get the work done fast. Buffalo needs this plane for an urgent job. The plane has to haul tons of mining equipment to a remote site where the landing strip is disappearing. Frozen lake, man. <laughs> it's not a runway. It's not a dirt strip. It's, you know, that much ice and water, you know, and the surface can change in a matter of an hour or two. A mining company needs 350,000 pounds of supplies delivered from their base in Geraldton, Ontario, to a remote mining camp further north. Buffalo is sending a C-46 crew 2,200 kilometers from Yellowknife to Geraldton. They'll have to take multiple runs from there to the remote mining camp. And the only place to land is on a frozen lake. This job entails probably the hardest thing you could do at Buffalo. You don't have the luxury of saying, well, we'll go tomorrow or we'll go next week and stuff because it can be gone. Buffalo President Joe McBrien is pushing for the quickest possible departure. The mechanics have to pack every spare part the crew might need for at least two weeks of flying. Any delays due to mechanical problems could fuel Joe's wrath. If you need something, we got to send it down there, and somebody's going to freak out. you like, you know who, right? Eh? No names. Let me know when you see him around, because I'm going to off and hide somewhere. When the old man is running around the hangar, what he's trying to do is amalgamate everybody's focus to get the airplane to the job so we don't lose the job. The urgent priority is patching the C-46's fuselage back together. This delay couldn't have come at a worse time because Joe's already frustrated by another delay. 6,300 kilometers away, one of Joe's CL-215 water bombers is grounded. He sold two of them to Turkey, but an engine problem has stranded this one on the Atlantic island of Santa Maria in the Azores, just over halfway to its destination. Mechanic Matt Belanger has spent days trying to determine the problem. The good news, he now knows what it is. Well, that governor uh, doesn't work at all. The bad news, he can't fix it without a replacement prop governor, a key part that regulates propeller speed. It's unfortunate we got to waste a beautiful day like this. I mean, the conditions are perfect to go. Meanwhile, the other CL-215 with Captain Arnie Schrader, co-pilot Justin Simley, and mechanic Corey Dodd on board is on its way to coastal Spain. They still have two more legs and over 3,000 kilometers to go on this extraordinary journey. Hi, remember, first transfer proceed, uh, be advised your radio is hardly uh, here, Bill. You have a lot of garbling on it. That's just me talking in English. But 150, 111. Garcia, Spain. That's where we are. This is just a refueling pit stop. Arnie wants to wait for his colleagues still in the Azores, but under orders from Joe, he's pushing onward. Well, you'd like to finish the trip as a team, but we were actually encouraged to keep going, if I can put it that way. 
I'll call for the clearance. We got boost pumps in the uh, taxi checklist. Bunker request. The crew will fly 1,400 kilometers to Malta today, and then another 1,600 kilometers to their final destination, Ankara, Turkey, tomorrow. After crossing the treacherous North Atlantic, flying over the Mediterranean should be a breeze. Uh, it was pretty, very scenic route. It was very nice. The first probably hour was good, and then what into the hour and a half, second hour, we ran into a bit of ice, a bunch of crappy clouds and stuff. Nice. Oh, yeah. Nice. I'm cloudy. Yeah, it's up. It was minus 10 or something, and we were going through a lot of clouds, so we, we picked up quite a bit of ice. The water bomber has no systems to shed ice, because water bombers normally fly in summer. Ice could bring the plane down. I was trying to stay out of it, just, but I can't see where it is now. That's the tough part. All they can do is try to keep away from the clouds. This airplane does not like ice. Back in Yellowknife, Rampy's Wilf Dar and Audrey Marchand are working the ramp. Later this morning, they have flight attendant school, the vital next step in their careers at Buffalo. But one of the Rampies in the course is missing, Jeremy Dow. Yes, who just called? Who? Jeremy. Hi. <laughs> He's not on the plane. <laughs> not joking. <laughs> Jeremy Dow is currently the longest serving rampy at Buffalo. He's been working hard at the Hay River Terminal for over six months. This morning, there was no room for him on the daily passenger flight to Yellowknife, 200 kilometers away. I've had a string of some rough luck, I suppose. As a result, he'll miss another flight attending class. He's already way behind Audrey and Wilf, who are based in Yellowknife. Flight attending, that's an intermediate step between uh, rampy and flying the sked, which is sort of the stepping stone to the entire company. The FNG here. Graham's the FNG. <laughs> New guys. Even with rampy Graham Ferguson ready to take over in Hay River, Jeremy is still struggling to get to Yellowknife where the action is. But today, he's stuck here. In some of these situations, the best man doesn't always win. They try to be as fair as they can, but in the end, it's there's a fair bit of luck thrown into it all. In the Yellowknife hangar, the clock is ticking. The delay getting the C-46 ready has Buffalo Joe worried because the ice runway in northern Ontario is rapidly thawing. And Joe's also not sure C-46 Captain Devin Brooks is the man to lead this job. Uh, Devin and Joe always have a rocky relationship. Devin, uh, this type of person that stands up for himself, and Joe's the type of person that stands up for the company, and uh, that type of thing usually clashes. With only a few ice landings under his belt, Devin's feeling the pressure. In the back of your mind, you're wondering how thick the ice is. You got to take in consideration how slippery it is. So Joe's brought in a ringer, a second, more seasoned captain named Gislain de Rocher. Even though he hasn't flown the C-46 in months. He knows ice. You need, to warm up. you need it to warm up five degrees yeah. out that way. It would be... Warm it up five degrees. Keep it five degrees above. And when you get to the ice strip over there, you're going to regret seeing it. Well, yeah. This is going to be some slippery, man. <laughs> but solving one problem could cause another. Every time you have two captains on a, on a trip or on a job, uh, you get two bosses. It's kind of like saying you have two prime ministers and they're both with different parties. They're, no one would get along. Uh, sometimes you need a sole person there to make a decision. Devin wants to know who will be in charge. Joe gathers the whole crew to sort it out. What I'm going to do is send you guys down and you have the most experience. He's going to be the captain in charge going down. Devin's been here for like flying every day, 40 below. Uh, and then you have someone uh, like Justine who comes in who's got insane amount of experience, but he hasn't flown in eight months. I'm going to put uh, my most experienced guy on the first couple trips for the ice. It's not the news Devin wanted to hear. Flying that airplane, you have to fly it. I was off for three and a half weeks, four weeks. 
And that playing is difficult to get back in the groove, even for me. He knew that he could do the job by himself, and he didn't need to be monitored at all. Gislain wastes no time taking over. The forecast for the morning. That's the best scenario. No, no. Yeah, that's, uh... I don't like that one. And I don't care if David likes it. The cracks are starting to show, even before they hit the ice. Coming up, the crew faces a treacherous situation on the ice air strip. It's a race against melting ice. Buffalo's own Rosie the Riveter, Christina Besson, is still patching up the C-46 that's supposed to fly today to a slushy landing strip on a northern Ontario lake. Trying to get it done for Joe. <laughs> He gets in at uh, 8.15 and it's 7.20. <laughs> yeah, the rush is on. I don't want to see him get bad. <laughs> and there's still friction over who will fly the plane. Buffalo Joe made an unpopular move, making Devin Brooks the junior of two captains. Even Joe's sons, Mikey and Rod, don't agree with his decision. I was, I guess, I guess a little bit politically pressured to uh, use my voice of reasoning with my father to uh, get Devin on board. Oh, I just want him to change, change it to Devin's the captain. The people in the company wanted to support Devin because Devin spent all winter pushing pallet jacks and was here in the morning at four or five getting the plane ready. A thousand hours a year, 60 hours a year. Who's the captain? Ghislain de Rocher's lack of recent flying time isn't the only concern. When Ghislain's here, he works hard, right? But he isn't, he's older. Right? So in the physical boom, 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 go, go pace, you know, he's going to get a little more worn down than, you know, say us in our, you know, late 20s, early 30s. Joe's DC-3 touches down in Yellowknife. He's heard about the tension in the hangar. He needs to get it resolved and get the C-46 in the air and on the job before the ice landing strip in northern Ontario melts away. You want to go into a meeting with a bunch of pilots, That'd probably be a closed one. It just won't be a very pleasant one. So we we're all wondering, what's the final call going to be? There's like five people that have their bags packed. But it's like, who's going? I don't want people going off if you're not comfortable with experience level, background level, or whatever. What I want to know in a closed meeting, there's no cameras in here, nothing. What would you guys be comfortable doing? Just serving you, Jeremy Dow flew in with Joe this morning so he can finally attend the flight attendant course with the other Rampies. I am sort of next in line, so me not being part of this course is a little silly, so may as well do it right now when we can. If I do all the flight attendant course, become the, the primary flight attendant, then uh, it'll mean a faster progression into a pilot seat. Jeremy's been focused on this step up the Buffalo ladder for months, but it might not be as easy as he thinks to keep up with his rivals. And uh, if you smell fuel, fumes in the cabin, what might be another good idea to do? Turn off cabin lighting. Is using switches a good idea when you've got fumes? You can Just a open the vents. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to know your your emergency calls, all of your emergency procedures. Right. You have to know number of exits for number of people. You have to know just weird, inane crap. So confused. Jeremy's starting to realize how far behind the other two he actually is. Sure. Downstairs in the office, the meeting to sort out the C-46 flight crew is over. Joe had thought about it overnight and had come to the conclusion that the two-captain idea was not good. Uh, definitely Joe was pressured to only send Devin when he wanted to send just Len and Devin together. Oh, Joe and I get along pretty good. I just tell him my opinion. That's me. I don't say it in a brash or rude way. I just get my point across, and he gets his across first. 
Joe understands that a united crew is essential, so Devin is made captain, and Scott is now co-pilot on the Ontario job. And Gislan is going home. I think it's Gislan, but he hasn't flown the damn thing in seven months. I know how rusty I am on it after you know a couple of weeks. Like, I wouldn't feel comfortable with Gislan being in control. It's all settled. A few final touches to the ice shield, and the C-46 is ready to fly. So now we can load this pig and, I guess, hit the road. The crew needs a rampy to prep the plane. Since Jeremy is the last one into the flight attending course, he's the first one pulled out to help on the ramp. I'm enjoying myself with the frost fighter. Warming up the 46, getting them ready to getting it ready to maybe go to Ontario with any luck. Ontario would be nice. Apparently Ontario's warm. But warm isn't a good thing. Not when the landing strip is made of ice. It's the end of the line for Arnie, Justin, and Corey in the CL215 water bomber. They're about to complete the final leg of their 12,000 kilometer journey from Red Deer, Alberta to Ankara, Turkey. On the tarmac, Turkish aviation officials await the arrival of their new plane. Oh, it is. First amphibic aircraft to Turkey. Charlie, November Foxtrot, you may continue to stand 205 in Ampliford. Can you get that figured out? Uh, I don't even know what he said. Cool, man. We're here. How was it? Awesome, man. Good trip. Great trip. Back home to Turkey. Hi. Oh, nice to meet you, Arthur. This is you can tell hey, they're quite excited about these airplanes. Eh? It's a good boat, it's not a very good airplane. Hi, how are you? Good, finally here. I mean, we look probably like a bunch of rednecks getting out of our, our flying boat, but uh, yeah, they, uh, they take it pretty seriously around here. After a 1,600 kilometer flight from Malta, the crew could use a rest, but the Turks have more business on the agenda. Good eat now. Yes, eight pints. And uh, I think it's about, it takes about uh, one month or something like that. Uh, no, we're going to do it. And I'd prefer to do it a lot quicker than that because I have to be back to train our guys. <laughs> <laughs> the delays getting to Turkey have messed with the schedule. As soon as Arnie and Justin finish training the Turkish pilots, Buffalo needs them back in Yellowknife to train water bomber pilots for their fire season. Once we get the other airplane here, then everything will be good. So once they show up, then. But they won't be showing up anytime soon. Even if I put that governor on his governs, we still have to put it underneath load. Yeah, that's all we can do. Then you're gonna have another new governor on the right engine. Yeah. They're waiting for a replacement propeller governor that's been sent from Yellowknife. That's a lot of work, right? That's all. But it's stuck in customs on the Portuguese mainland. Coming up, Justin is pulled out of Turkey. Ready to go to Ontario now? Let's get going. To come to the rescue in Northern Ontario. In Yellowknife, Buffalo Airways C-46 crew is finally heading off on a major contract to haul equipment for a mining company in Northern Ontario. But co-pilot Scott Blue has just learned that their load has nearly doubled. Original job was for 350,000 pounds. Um, with a limited time frame, we can only go into the ice road as uh, our ice strip is melted. So now we're up to 600,000 pounds, so. The C-46 has a maximum hauling capacity of 14,000 pounds. To complete the job, it will have to make more than 40 trips between Geraldton, Ontario, and the mining camp with the ice landing strip. If we had a bit longer time frame, we could do it, but the time is running short, so we might be sending another plane. We have an airport that's disappearing by the day. Every day we don't fly, it's getting worse. Ready, clear? From a business standpoint and from 
uh, standpoint of getting the job done, two airplanes is better than one. So they're pulling a second plane, their backup DC-4, into service. We got to get two airplanes ready to go, maybe to Ontario. Another one of those last minute things that happens in Buffalo. And if the DC-4 also heads to Ontario, Jeremy Dow will lose his teacher. Flight attendant manager Dan Catoni is the DC-4 co-pilot. Well, if Dan leaves and ends the class, then I'm uh, kind of screwed for flight attending for a bit. Without Dan, the class will be on hold, and Jeremy could lose his chance to graduate. Another speed bump on the road to his dream. I don't worry about roller coasters. I don't worry about getting too pissed off about anything, so. It's just, well, OK, I was a little pissed off. Here comes Spanky. On the tarmac, C-46 oh, Captain okay. Devin Brooks is ready to fly the lead plane. Yeah, have Dunkin' Donuts. Sir. He won the popular vote over a more experienced flyer to captain this mission to northern Ontario. Now we're on our way to Thompson. First stop, get some fuel. Hope the weather gets better in Ontario. All right, see you later. Better means colder. The ice strip he'll have to make repeated landings on is melting fast. After two stressful, challenging days, Devin and Scott's real challenge is about to begin. 2,200 kilometers away on a narrow strip of thawing ice. Now, the focus turns to prepping the second plane for the job, the DC-4. The plane needs to follow the C-46 to Ontario as soon as possible. The two planes will share the workload and the ice strip landings before the rising temperature makes the job impossible. But there's just one problem. We don't have a cap. We have a co-pilot, which is Dan Catoni, and a secondary co-pilot, which is Alex Wagner. The ideal DC-4 captain is over 8,000 kilometers away in Turkey. Hey, Justin, it's Mikey. Hey, what's happening, man? Hey, I'm just on the computer here. I'm supposed to get you uh, home as soon as possible. Justin, right now, is the highest time ice work guy we have with the DC-4. And uh, so we need him here. And we got to do whatever it takes to get him here. Um, it's going to be Ankara, Istanbul, Chicago, yeah. Edmonton. Yeah, you're turning to the right, Jen. Justin's sudden departure leaves Arnie in the lurch. There's a lot of work to do, yeah. A lot of paperwork and a lot of training to do. The other water bomber crew is still stuck in the Azores, waiting for the replacement part to clear Portuguese customs. So Arnie has to begin training the Turkish pilots on his own. And then we'll just kind of repeat it again. And then we'll go to the airplane and look at it there and go over it there. It was very. <laughs> But all Arnie can do is ground training. He hasn't received permission from Turkish authorities to fly yet. Yeah, and your scoops are down here, and they, you know, that's a that switch inside. They, they just go down hydraulically. The Buffalo C-46, piloted by Devin Brooks and Scott Blue, along with engineer Adam Smith, arrives in the northern Ontario town of Geraldton. From here, They'll load the plane and begin shuttling supplies to a remote camp on a frozen lake that's melting fast. It's supposed to be beautiful up there, so try to get a couple trips in at least. Ignition switches to about go, go, okay. Devin and Scott are used to making cargo runs but neither of them have much experience landing on ice. First time I'd gone as a co-pilot to land on a frozen lake. We wanted to get it done as soon as we could because it was starting to melt and starting to get warmer. You could feel it. Right now, the ice on the lake is just over three feet thick. But if the spring thaw melts it down more than a few inches, the fully loaded and fueled C-46 could crash right through. But even if the ice thickness holds, just two hours of warm spring sun will melt the top layer, creating a slippery film of water and a treacherous landing surface. Let's say that's the strip way up there. Uh, past the dark area, that next open white one. Yeah, I agree. 
but the landscape is dotted with lakes. As they get closer, the pilots get a better look. Oh, yeah, check that. We got you. Hey, we're gonna have to... Maybe that wasn't the lake. What the f are we landing on? That lake that looks like an elbow. Looks shoveled off. They spot the lake. But it's not as wide as they expected. And neither is the narrow landing strip. That lake's gonna go up quick, eh? Pretty f thin. It's tiny. Devin and Scott are about to slam the 47,000 pound C-46 down on just a few feet of ice. The only true test of whether the ice will hold. Northern Ontario, Captain Devin Brooks and co-pilot Scott Blue are about to land a fully loaded Buffalo Airways C-46 on a frozen lake. Ready to one flap, one flap. But they have no idea how thick the ice is and if it can hold the 47,000 pounds of vintage airplane. 8576. 8576. The melting ice holds. But there are other problems with this landing strip. Runway's gonna be a shit. This narrow runway makes everything more difficult. Got a bit of one spot to turn around, no. No. It's pretty narrow. Where's your wing there? Over? It's over. Their wings are hanging over the snowbank edges of the strip. If you get into any windy conditions on a slick strip, you need margin for error, you know what I mean? Like on the runway, and there's very little of that. So my wing is right on the edge. My, the tip of my wing is on the snowbank, like where it's high, but there's still snow about a third of the way out of the wing. Yeah, it looks to be the same all the way, eh? This thing sucks. Halfway around the world, Arnie Schrader is in a jam. Turkish authorities haven't cleared him to fly, so he hasn't logged a single hour of actual flight training with the Turkish water bomber pilots. So, instead of a cockpit, Today, he's in a waiting room with engineer Corey Dodd. Yeah, we need uh, permission from the navigation department of, uh, of Turkey just to commence uh, flight training. So that's what we're trying to get. I don't know how long that's going to take. They seem to take their time with it, so. Politics. So, while waiting for that permit to come through, Arnie and Corey take in the sights of Ankara. Golden arches. I like their flag. It's going to look pretty cool on the airplane. They're putting it on there right now, I think. In Geraldton, Ontario, co-pilot Scott Blue and the rest of the C-46 crew wake up to another day of cargo shuttles and ice strip landings. Time to go. It's 6 a.m. Saturday morning. The weather's good. We're going to go fly our ass off today. Well, our schedule was get as many trips in and as many loads as we could do in a day. Dust till dawn if it was nice conditions. But with the ice runway melting on them, time is not on their side. But it's already starting to melt with just that sun on it. Yeah. 
It's slick as shit right here. Yep, we can see it. Shit, like yeah. it turn any any better. The ice strip is turning to slush. They don't know how much longer they can land here. The daily flight from Edmonton lands at the Yellowknife Airport. Bringing home Buffalo Captain Justin Simley from Turkey. He's crossed nine time zones to get here. This is the best part about going on the road is coming home, you know. But this homecoming will be brief. Ready to go to Ontario now? Let's get going. <laughs> Under Joe's orders, yeah. he has to get the DC-4 to Geraldton, Ontario right away. So jet lag Justin jumps right into the scramble to finish prepping the plane. Justin and his crew will join the C-46 shuttling mining supplies to a remote camp on a frozen lake. Watch the top. You got that hook on the top, eh? the, the, the lift brace. Okay. With the addition of the DC-4, Buffalo will now have a chance of getting the job done before the ice landing strip melts. But Justin's not so sure about the narrow runway. When you're working the ice this late in the season, if, you, if you've got no traction and you've got a runway that's got a turn in it, uh, you're going to go off the side of it. But there's no turning back now. It's a good thing Justin's DC-4 is on the way, because there's a serious problem in Northern Ontario. The C-46 is out of commission. The left wing tip was dented during an ice strip landing. In a local hangar, engineer Adam Smith is making a speedy repair. We cut the old piece out, and we're riveting it in a new piece, because all the cracks in there are not exactly good. Luckily, the old Warbird was built to take a beating. But the accident is going to cause big trouble for the plane's captain, Devin Brooks. The mining company that contracted Buffalo on this job has seen the wing damage. Mining companies uh, in the 21st century are a new breed. They are extremely safety oriented. And they've called Buffalo Joe to complain. I want you to move so far. So they only have done it. I guess we screwed up a little bit down there. Maybe I didn't report it to the right person. And the person I reported it to didn't report it up the, up the ladder either. It just got blown out of proportion. Whether it's been blown out of proportion or not, Joe's been caught completely off guard. The job's gone side, uh, sideways on me. Shit happens. I can't help it. I wasn't here. I wasn't there. The upsetting part was trying to get the proper information. You know, we're getting the information secondhand and backward. Okay, who wants it replaced? The client is so upset, they want Joe to send out a new pilot. Right now, he's mad at everybody. He's mad at the pilots of the C-46, everybody down to the person filling it with gas. And this report just came through on the facts. But one fact is clear. No matter how many people share the blame, in Joe's eyes, only one bears responsibility. It's the captain that has to report it, right? We and Devin and Adam and the co-pilots and the other captain all sat in that room up there with me with all the reasons why Devin should do it and the Frenchman shouldn't. Everybody had their say. He's got to get that job done because he put himself in that position by saying he was the best to do it. I could fire him, which you probably will have. That night, Justin's DC-4 hits the runway in Geraldton. How was Turkey? Delightful. Devin's relieved that reinforcements have arrived, but he's completely unaware that back in Yellowknife, Buffalo Joe is calling for his head. Coming up, Mikey stands up to Joe. Just one little thing, and you can say we're all useless. But is it enough to save Devin's job? Another tense day at Buffalo. It's exam time. Rampy's Audrey Marchand and Wilf Dar have completed the flight attending course. Now they're writing the final exam. 
while Jeremy Dow, in Yellowknife for the day, is stuck working the ramp. It's certainly an imperfect situation. I'd like to have the opportunity to be keeping up with them. Uh, it's too late now, and it's going to be pretty darn tough to, to keep up if I'm not in Yellowknife. Despite seniority, he's become the low rampy on the Buffalo totem pole. Well, I have to go back down to uh, Hay River tonight because uh, one of the guys, Dwayne, is uh, taking a few days off for uh, medical reasons, so I'm going to be covering for him, so I can't stay here. Being based in Hay River is clearly not working for Jeremy. He'll have to seriously consider a permanent move to Yellowknife if he has any hope of catching up to his rivals. Meanwhile, in the hangar, mechanics prep the Beechcraft Baron. The Baron will fetch C-46 Captain Devin Brooks from Northern Ontario. After damaging a wingtip, the client wants him off the job. Devin. General Manager Mikey McBrien has to break the news to Devin. Hey, Devin, it's Mikey. Hey, man. Hey, uh, did, did anybody tell you the Baron's coming? I have to sympathize with the customer. And if the customer wants something done, um, we just do it. If they want yeah, the cabins updated. replaced, you just do it. But. OK, cool. So that was Devin. He understands and that we're replacing them. It's kind of hard to see. I know these guys on a personal level. Sometimes I wish I didn't. I wish, uh, wish I had uh, a different uh, different relationship with them because it's hard, uh, this stuff. But we got to uh, we gotta keep everybody happy. One person who's happy is Rampy Wilf Dar. He's just finished writing his flight attendant exam and is getting a chance to fly today. Being airborne makes me very happy. I start to smile like an idiot. Wilf has hundreds of hours flying small aircraft and is co-piloting the Baron. The twin-engine plane is taking C-46 Captain A.J. DeCoe's to Geraldton. A.J. is replacing Devin Brooks, who will return to Yellowknife in the Baron. No one at Buffalo knows what Joe will do when Devin comes back. Yeah, well, you know, accidents have happened before, man. I don't understand why this is such a nightmare. In Buffalo's cargo terminal, People Devin's talk. girlfriend, Janelle Glenn, is upset. That's craziness. I just talked to Devin. Devin said it's not a big deal. You know, and then all of a sudden, oh, he could be losing his license over this one, and we'll be surprised if he has a job over this one. I guess it comes with the territory, <laughs> but I think it's horseshit, personally. And the fallout from Devin's accident is complicating things even more. Janelle's boss, Kelly Jurasevic, was counting on Captain A.J. DeCoast to fly a food delivery up the Mackenzie Valley. My 48 hours is up tomorrow. I have to get them their food. Now, A.J.'s gone, and there's no other C-46 captain available. So. I don't know what the hell we're going to do here. I guess we got to hope and see. I got to do this meeting now. Buffalo Joe's still on edge over Devin and the damaged wingtip. Now he has to deal with this latest problem. It's not an extraordinary situation. What's extraordinary about it? Joe's coming down hard on Mikey and Kelly, insisting the food shipment should have gone out before AJ left for Ontario. So we knew about this 44 hours ago. And now we got to do it because we're out of our 48 hours. You know what I mean? He tends to point people out and, and focus all his negative energy in one source, and uh, I don't believe that's right. I don't think that we should be in shit for anything. A lot of times, he's mad about other things, and he kind of takes it on people, and uh, I don't think that is fair either. But there's more weighing on Kelly than getting food up the valley. Just worried about Devin. I know we'll get the food up to the communities, but I'm concerned about Devin because he's, you know, he works so hard for Buffalo. And, you know, he doesn't want to lose his job. In Geraldton, a worried Devin makes a long distance call to Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader in Turkey. Oh, it just hit the tip. Yeah. Oh, yeah, OK, well, that's, that's all. Why are they getting so uptight? Oh, I wouldn't worry about that too much. That's yellow knife making a mountain out of a molehill. Eh? That's exactly Devin's concern. He knows Joe has a tendency to overreact. 
Back in Yellowknife, Mikey takes his stand. He wants his father to think about the way he treats his staff before he confronts Devin tomorrow. Standing up to him, he is pretty intimidating, uh, as you can imagine. All the things that we do all the time that we do, and it's the one little thing, and you say we're all useless. And what I said is basically quit focusing on negative and actually give a little bit of positive back. I would just love for one time to say, hey, you didn't f up on this. It was kind of good. Basically, I think he was taken back by that a little bit and actually gave him a chance to step back and, and think about what happened. Joe's got the night to let Mikey's words sink in. And Devin has a long flight home to think about his future. Morning in Yellowknife. C-46 Captain Devin Brooks returns to face the music. Hey, you hear me, Devin? Yeah. And Buffalo Joe. I didn't really know what he was going to do. And it was just the whole thing of the rumors going around. Well, he hit a tree with a wing tip. Yes, sir. There's procedures in place to follow up after. You know? Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I don't the... know. I, I don't... Like it... I'm, not, I'm not judging either way. I'm not happy with with the way it turned out. When Joe's angry, uh, you better watch out. Unless you're dead perfect, you're gonna, you're gonna get it for sure. Find out how we can best handle this and prevent it from happening again. And if it does, Mikey's happen, words seem to have hit home. He tips off. Well, anyway, yep. go fly your miles and, and don't worry about it. Okay. No Joe lets Devin off the hook. I believe the end result talked that he, he, he gave Devin a little bit more slack. Um, and, and actually kind of put himself in Devin's shoes for a while. Hey, I've been wingtips too, and I've, I've been in situations. I mean, the situation Devin was in, I'd been there myself before, so I know. Yeah, don't worry about it. It surprised me that he was nice about it. Yes, we dinged the wing, but he was pretty calm, and I was flying that day. Nine o'clock, gotta get going. Joe's sending Devin right back into his C-46 to make Kelly's food delivery up the valley in the nick of time. I don't know if Devin deserved the break, but he got it. A week later, the DC-4 piloted by Captain Justin Simley returns from Ontario. C-46 with A.J. DeCoast at the controls follows close behind. The two crews finished up the job, making a total of 35 runs between Geraldton and the ice strip. An amazing feat. And since his talk with Mikey, one that even Joe has to acknowledge. Looking at the tonnage, the days, conditions you worked under, the size of your loads. Um, it was a remarkable job physically. You know, feel good he did a great job, all of you. Yeah, I, I truly believe that I made him think over the situation. We send you guys out what I believe very, very half-cocked, unprepared. And this was m my mistake because I was so wound up trying to figure out the ice conditions, who was going to fly the airplane. Joe just might be turning over a whole new leaf. But on the other hand, that's just a short-lived thing. It'll be something next week. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, Rampy Jeremy Dow gets into the cockpit of a DC-4. They're going to do the landing. And has to land the big plane for the first time. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader hits the water in Turkey. And the other water bomber hits the tarmac.